So, Greg, there's been a tidal wave of reaction <laughs> to this piece. Have you been surprised? I always wanted to get published in the Atlantic, so this was like a huge milestone for me. And the fact that it was the cover story, I was, couldn't have been more thrilled. But given that we were being critical of both microaggressions and trigger warnings in, in the course of the article, I was expecting, okay, I'm going to have to deal with a ton of hate mail for, for a long time coming. And sure, you get hate mail anytime you say anything provocative, but what I was pleasantly surprised by was how positive the response has been and how many local, for example, NPR shows I've done where professors have called in and said, yes, I'm really getting more worried about the, the, how, hard, how easy it is to say the wrong thing these days. Have you heard any specific new horror stories? Um, you know, not specifically, um, but I definitely have had a lot of professors. For example, Jay Rosen, uh, after reading the article, tweeted, that, uh, you know, this is a famous journalism professor at NYU, said that, yeah, I self-censored, and this is, this is a problem. Um, but, and uh, different professors calling and saying that they're, they're pretty wary. Have the academics identified it with it with the argument more than the students have? Have you been hearing from students as well? Um, I think probably the academics have identified with it more than the students. Probably the most hostile response I've gotten have been from uh, some administrators. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, yeah. And what do they say? Oh, just that, you know, uh, that the intention of all of this is uh, people focus a lot on, on the trigger warning yes, aspect of right. it. And for an 8,000 word piece, I, given the reaction, you could think that it was exclusively about, uh, uh, about trigger warnings. And they talk about this as being, you know, for example, the show I just did, they talked about, well, well they're compassionate. And right, the argument is that, look, trigger warnings is not the end of the world. We're just trying to be courteous right. and give them a heads up. We're not trying to actually censor. Um, the, w what they're exposed to, prevent them from being exposed to challenging ideas. A and absolutely, and, and I think uh, a lot of the response then has been non-responsive to what we actually wrote, <laughs> which is talking about how, well, one, there's no evidence that they are actually helpful, and there's good reason from you know, pretty standard psychology to think that they actually might be harmful. And a response that the Atlantic got that absolutely, you know, that uh, nearly brought me to tears because I just thought it was so beautiful, was someone talking about the fact that she lost her sister. Um, she committed suicide by jumping off of a building. And she relayed the story of that being covered in class in a, in a fictional work in which that's the way a character kills himself. And there was no trigger warning. There was no preparation for it. And it was the first time she had felt normal in years and that that meant the world to her to actually just be treated like everybody else. Where do you think the compulsion to use trigger warnings is coming from? I think it mostly comes from a, a good place. I, but I always say mostly because I think we're always, we always have mixed motives o about yeah. everything when it comes down to it. I think the way it started makes perfect sense, particularly when people were running websites that were specifically about sexual assault. Um, the idea of saying, trigger warning, we're going to have, uh, we're going to have a graphic discussion of sexual assault. But the problem is that it's just, uh, it, it, tends, it tends to take on momentum. And even by 2012, people who had started some of these websites were saying, listen, we now have a list of 25 things that have been requested for trigger warnings. This is getting out of hand. And that's part of the problem. When you, when you turn it into something that's fundamentally about sort of uh, someone's subjective response, it very quickly creates what you know, Connor Fuserdorf talks about, you know, th that essentially, you, you, why should your trauma be privileged over, over mine? Um, let me ask you about another criticism we've been getting at a piece, the, the grumpy old men criticism yes. that um, y you and your co-author are kind of weighing in on from the perspective of, of old guys like us on what's happening on uh -huh. campus and don't really understand what's going on. Um, with the youth of today. Yeah. I, 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 I You're telling them to get off your lawn. Dude. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I love the argument. I also love the graphic you guys used, which is Abraham Simpson, shout, uh, old man shouts at cloud. And it's one of those things where it's like, it's interesting, but it's not really an argument. It's right. not substantive. And I had some fun in my response to it getting into, okay, so is if, if this is more than a quip, is your premise that we shouldn't listen to generational criticisms. Right. And particularly when we're talking about wisdom learned from, uh, from the ancients that usually came from painful circumstances, I got into, into length saying, you know, I'm, I'm not going to even accept this as a, 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 as a premise to make, if people need to be reminded that life was harder for your grandparents and for their grandparents. That if you're looking at any time over the last 200 years, um, in very few circumstances, do you, do you have it harder than your great grandparents did? And wisdom comes from that pain and, and, and is handed down. So I think that generally saying that generational criticisms, that one generation looking at the younger generation and saying and uh, is being critical of them, the idea that you can just dismiss those out of hand is ridiculous. Meanwhile, it is a two-way street. Because I remember reading criticisms of Generation X and being like, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. Okay, well actually, yeah, you got me on that one. <laughs>
Um, but then, meanwhile, we certainly had many, many criticisms to offer right back to the baby boomers, some of which I think were probably unfair, some of them which were spot on. It's all, it's all part of the, of the greater discourse. Yeah, and, and, and part of the bigger debate. The, you know, one of the, uh, there's a mistake that we as Gen Xers might be making in the other direction, mm -hmm. which is those of us who are old enough to remember the last time we had a big fight about political right. correctness on campus was when the closing of the American Mind, Alan Bloom's book, came out. And the temptation, I think, um, uh, for a lot of us is to think these things just move in cycles. Yeah. And the pendulum swung one way in the 80s, and then it swung back, and now it's sw swinging back to where we were um, when, when Bloom's book appeared. Do you think that that's a valid assessment? I think there's some truth in it, but I don't think uh, history literally repeats. Yeah. And I think that what's going on now is really quite different than what was going on in the 80s and 90s. Um, and definitely part of it is that it has a very strong premise uh, today on a conception of human fragility. Uh, whereas in the, in the in, uh, 80s and 90s, there was a much stronger idea of empowerment, of challenging the canon, of greater diversity on campus, and this is, and this is the way to respect greater diversity. Whereas now, one of the reasons why I enjoyed writing this with the social psychologist was partially looking th at this with the lens of how a lot of these new, uh, this new speech policing is justified through reference to sort of psychological frailty and trying to make the point that this is not a positive way to, to, to look at people. It can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. So the argument then was more about the actual content of the curriculum. Mm -hmm rather than the way it was being taught? Well, well, there are similarities, and one of them was speech codes. Um, and speech codes back then, you know, that you had your first wave of campus speech codes that were introduced in 87, and then they were defeated from 1990, 1989 to 1995 mm -hmm. in, in court cases, the last one being actually at Stanford two years before I started law school there. Um, so the, the, they do have some characters in common, and speech codes are, are part of it. But the, but the sort of conception of what people, uh, of the fragility of people, that's been, that's one of the things that actually does make this different. Now, one criticism um, that, uh, that, that, that I thought was very valid was that we didn't mention the uh, consumerism aspect of it, that essentially universities are so concerned with making students happy um, because they're seen as, you know, they come with a $60,000 uh, check attached to them, essentially, that they're bending over backwards and doing kind of ridiculous things in order to please them. Um, that critic thought that was the entire story. I think it's part of it, but I do think it's it, it's very it, it is actually part of it. Have you gotten any sense yet, or are are you anticipating or hoping for any specific reforms coming out as a consequence of this? Mm. My greatest hope is that people look at the substance of the entire article because what we're trying to do is we're trying to introduce um, theories from cognitive behavioral therapy. And they're all about arguing fairly with ourselves. Um, and it, the amazing th thing about cognitive behavioral therapy is that it's one of the best treatments for anxiety and depression. And all it's saying is, learn better how to argue fairly with yourself. And all we're saying in the article is extend that outward. Uh, there was one critic who said, well, you have, you have unbounded faith in cognitive behavioral therapy. No, that's not entirely true. But I do think our entire society, uh, both campus, uh, on campus and off, would benefit from us being a little, uh, asking ourselves, am I engaged in personalizing? Am I engaged in black and white thinking? Am I engaged in magnification? And I think if we were to be a little more critical about the way we argue both internally and externally with each other, we could have much more productive arguments. Well, and, and, and core to the, to the, to the central argument of the piece is that the students themselves are the victims here, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And that's, that, that's one thing that I do want to stress is, is when someone was saying, oh, this is a Kids Today article. I'm like, yeah. no, 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 we yeah. did this to you. Um, a, a generation of, of parents and a generation of, of K through 12 education that really did them the disfavor of saying, you know, uh, contrary to, 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 to Buddhism, life shouldn't be pain or life isn't pain, which I think is a terrible thing to teach people um, because as soon as you teach people, you know, life is pain to a degree, immediately it becomes less painful. And also telling them in, incorrectly that you're incredibly fragile, um, that you have no resiliency, and if, and if you experience some of these things, you're, 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 you're done for, which is also not true. Right. So so this is truly a self-hating Gen Xer piece <laughs> rather than a critique of the morning. Right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think we've, 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 we've done a lot of harm. And what Wendy Kaminer, uh, you know, wrote a great book in, in the 90s, uh, s seeing this coming, where, where if you have sort of this therapeutic state kind of idea, it can actually end up being incredibly disempowering as opposed to empowering um, to, to generations.